sent from above. You had no place to lay your head. You came to earth, perfect in love. You were obedient to death. Tell the world what you've done. Tell the world of the sun. You have risen from the grave. All creation shouts your name, and our tongues will confess your blood bought our righteousness. We will bow before your throne. is paid, we've been set free, your life was poured out to the grave, the wrath of God now satisfied, the love of God truly displayed, tell the world what you've done, tell the world of the sun, you have risen from the grave, oh Shouts your name, and our tongues will confess your blood bought our righteousness. We will bow before your throne and will worship you alone. You alone. From death to life, reigning on high. The empty tomb, the risen Lord And now we wait for your return To see the earth once more restored Tell the world what you've done Tell the world of the sun You have risen from the grave All creation shouts your name And our tongues will confess your blood we will bow before your throne And we'll worship you alone You alone You alone a mighty Savior You alone a mighty Savior You alone a mighty Savior You alone a God You alone i mm -hmm.
walked from you Our backs to you we've turned Tried to justify ourselves But only darkness earned Squandered all your precious gifts Distorted your great light Created idols for ourselves Trying to fill the hole inside How could we come Back to you How could we come Though we weren't deserved and welcome to Barney's Online for another week. So glad that you could be engaging with this content. Hey, I hope that you've managed to meet with someone else and together watch church. 
This week, as we wrap up our series, we've been engaged with the whole term, we conclude with the question, hasn't science disproved Christianity? Adam's going to help us think about what the Bible has to say about knowing and knowing the world, about God and how he has created the world, as well as engaging with that question and the philosophy behind it. How can we know whether science and religion have anything to say to each other? How should we think about science, the scientific discoveries in our world? And what is it at the end of the day that we want to learn as we read the Bible and engage with the world that God has made? I'm going to commend our time to God now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we stop today to reflect upon your world, please help us to understand it from your perspective. Thank you that because of who you are, we can know this world. We can engage with it in ways that are reliable, consistent and trustworthy. Father, thank you that it's the great Christian thinkers of the past who have brought us what we now consider to be science. And we thank you, Father, that in your world, things work your way. Help us today to trust you all the more, to love you all the more and to live as your people in this world as a result of what we hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
hear God speak now as the Bible is read and as Adam comes and explains it to us, I'm going to pray and ask God to speak. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, please give us eyes that will see, ears that will hear, hearts that are humble and minds that are open. Teach us your ways, please. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to read from two parts of the Bible. The first is Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, as it lays out for us the very first creation account. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning, the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruits with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning, the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, Let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters of the seas. And let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. 
God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in it was completed. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. For on it he rested from all his work of creation. Our second Bible reading is from the New Testament, from one of the letters that Paul wrote, in particular the letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. One Corinthians 2, verse 10. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught Breathe. 
Have you ever been completely sure about something only to find out later that you were wrong? Now, some people might call that marriage or being a male, but I have done this before I was married. When I was in France, I remember we were going away on the tour and we had to catch a train to another place at Cannes. And as we were travelling there, I was memorising the way because I didn't think I'd be able to get on the train for various reasons. And when we got to the station, I, I ended up being late for the train. And so as we tri- uh, travelled to the train station, I memorised the way to the train station. I, I sh- was sure I knew the way how to get back to where we were staying. And so the train had left and I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to walk back. I've memorised this. I know the way. And so I started walking back to where I thought, and I have to say this, where I thought we were staying. And then as I was walking back, it started to rain. And I don't mean a little bit of rain. It poured. And I had no umbrella. I had really no sense of where I was going, only what I had thought I remembered and no, just the clothes on my back. And off I walked and I walked and then it rained and I was outside of the town where the train was and it was bucketing rain. And it came to the point when I finally had to acknowledge to myself, dude, you don't know where you're going. And so turned around I did and started heading back in the pouring rain. There's cars coming (laughs) along the road and there's splashing water all over me. And it got to the point even that I stopped caring about getting wet. I was just so saturated from the rain and all the water. I just went, oh, whatever. When I had taken off, when I had started, I was sure I knew where I was going. But later on, I had to acknowledge, "Eh, I'm wrong and I need to backtrack. I need to sort things out and figure out my bearings once again. In life, we can get to the point where we're sure, we know which direction we are going. We're sure we know the answers to our particular questions. But sometimes we need to stop take a breath and realise, hey, maybe I'm not right here. Now, we've been doing this series, this short series, After Two Ways to Live, considering objections to Christianity. And the objection that this was number three on the list and it just came under is the Bible history was this. Does science disprove Christianity? Does science disprove Christianity? Christianity. Really when we're talking about this question and the essence of this question is, it is simply this, how do we know God? How can we know who God is? God is a being who exists outside of creation. God is a being who who made the creation but exists separate to the creation. And when we're dealing with God and we're dealing with Christianity, what we're trying to know is who God is, how God can reveal himself without corrupting his own nature. And so as we come to this question, what we're really talking about is how do we know God or how has God revealed himself in a way that we can know who he is? When we're talking about science, we are talking about a way of knowing the world. We are talking about how a way of understanding the world. And so the question we need to deal with is how do we know God and how does this tool we call science relate to God? Now, the word science comes from the Latin word scientia, which just means to know. But when people talk about science, are they saying, well, what we know disproves Christianity? But 
And that could be true, and it is true in some cases, but I think they mean something slightly different. And what people generally mean when they're dealing with this question isn't, does our knowledge disprove Christianity? They're generally meaning the scientific method, the way of understanding the world, the tool called science has disproven Christianity. When people talk about science, they are generally talking about the empirical method. And it's that method we all learnt at school. You know, you get a hypothesis, then you list all your equipment and how you're going to do your, uh, your experiment. Then you list how you did your experiment and then you list all the results, you, you table all the results, and then you come up with your conclusions. When people are talking about science, that's what they're talking about. But there are other branches of sciences. There's what's basically called historical sciences, so things that investigate things like the Big Bang, or theoretical sciences, where people use what we know about the world and what we know about the creation to come up with theories that explain other attributes that we expect to see in creation. Now, they are valid branches of science, but that's not what generally people are talking about when they're saying science disproves Christianity. What they're generally talking about is the knowledge we gain through repeated experiments and from what we see through repeated experiments. Well, that shows that Christianity is completely wrong. I remember when I was at university and, you know, Campbelltown was a science campus. It was a health science campus, but it did have a large science faculty on, at the site. And so I put up this sign to try and generate some discussion. And one of the, the sign I placed up was, do you have faith in science? And I remember this one conversation I had with this guy. He came up and we spoke for about half an hour and it, it really didn't go well the conversation just really ended up flat. And the reason it was a real struggle is the guy kept on saying to me, faith and science are completely different. We're talking about different realms. And I was trying to explain to him that his own understandings of the language is not helping him to understand the question, not seeing the relevance of the question together. And he just, in his own mind, he couldn't, hear what I was saying because he had his own pre, uh, presuppositions and pre-questions and pre-definitions that had blocked him from hearing what was being said. And it really was an unsuccessful and unfruitful conversation. The reason I bring this up is that when we say the word science, we are going to import our own ideas, our own concepts. Even to talk about science, we just got to realise what are we talking about? Are we talking about the, the historical sciences? Are we talking about the, the theoretical sciences? Or are we are talking about the empirical method? Now, when I'm talking about science in this talk and in this concept, context, I am mainly going to be referring to the empirical method. That is just repeated experiments in a certain situation, in a, in a certain context, because that's what people generally mean when they talk about science. My point, as we talk about science and as we talk about all of this, is that as we think about the issue, we must be clear about what science can do what we can know about the world and really how does what we know about the world relate to the subject of the Bible. Christianity flows out of the Bible. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is a religion based on the word of God or what the Bible claims is the word of God. And that Christianity is a life lived in response to the call of the Father to be in the image of the Son by the power of the Spirit. That's what it means to be Christian, as a person who trusts in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And it's a, it's a dealing with, and this is what the Bible's dealing with, a relationship of God to his creation or God to humanity. And this is what we need to remember as we come to deal with this question. The Bible is about 
God's relationship to man. It isn't a scientific textbook and it's not meant to be one. In terms of the observable objects in creation, it doesn't really have a lot to say and that is the Bible. It describes phenomena in creation and the Bible uses language to describe the phenomena but it's just basically the stuff that you can see with your eyes or smell with your nose or hear with your ears. It is not really going into in-depth descriptions of the relationships that exist within creation. And you see that in the language it uses. So this is, comes from Psalm 19. In the heavens, he, being God, has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Now, when we're talking about the Bible and when we're talking about language in general, we must allow the author to describe or to define the terms that they're using. And this makes sense. No one likes to be taken out of context. And so... When I talk about should, and we hear the question, should a person take the Bible literally, I would answer yes, of course. And then people will go, oh, well, you know, then do you believe that the, that the sun races from one end of the heavens to the other? And I go, of course not. Why? Because I'm allowing the author to describe his own terms. I'm allowing the author to describe his own language. And we do this even today. No one says when they see the sunset and they enjoy it, they go, oh, that's a beautiful earth rotation. We all say that's a beautiful sunset. And it's not because we believe that the sun's revolving around the earth. It's because that's just the way we describe what we're seeing. We just know that that is a description of the phenomena. And we accept that. When it comes to the Bible, we must allow the authors to do exactly the same thing. We must allow the authors to use and define language as they see. And then we, the goal of, sorry, I should put it this way, the goal of reading the Bible is not to interpret it. It is to comprehend it, to understand what it is saying on its own terms and then to judge or, uh, or ignore on the basis of what it's saying, not on what I think it's saying, not on the basis of what I hope it's saying, but on the basis of what it says on its own terms. Which brings us to what is probably the most controversial passage when dealing with this question, and that is Genesis 1. How does Genesis 1, or what is Genesis 1's relationship to science. And that's what people are always thinking about. It is a very much a question of our, of our age. People are always thinking about, and when you read topics as is Genesis 1 verse science, and you'll notice I didn't say that. I said, what is Genesis 1's relationship to science? When we read the Bible, we must understand this. The Bible is not as interested in its own, in your questions. It is far more interested in the answers it is giving. And so when we're reading the Bible, we're not trying to answer our questions. We're trying to understand the answers to the questions it is seeking to answer. And they're not always the same. It's not saying that our questions are unimportant. It's just that that is not the first priority we need to consider. And so when we're reading Genesis 1, there is really four things that Genesis 1 is teaching. And I'm just going to go through them here. And these are the four main things that Genesis 1 is teaching. And the first one is simply this. God is the creator of the universe. That is the fundamental divide that exists within all of creation is that which exists between the creator and and his creation. And this just comes from Genesis, verse one, uh, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
God is the creator, we are the creation. And that is the first thing we learn from this passage. The second thing, the creation is structured and ordered towards God's purposes. The creation is structured and ordered towards God's purposes. And we see this, it comes out in Genesis 2, and you see it throughout the rest of the passage, but it's really now the heavens, uh, now the earth was formless and empty. And really that is the, one of the passages or the main ideas that Genesis 1 is uh, reversing, the, structures, the structurelessness or the formlessness of the universe and creation, and God structures it, and then he fills those structures. So that's point two. The third point, within creation, man has been created as one flesh to relate to each other as male and, fe male and female as his image bearers. Man has been created as one flesh, as both male and female, to relate as his image bearers. And we see this in 127. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And the fourth point is simply this. Creation's purpose is to relate to God in his rest or Sabbath from within his own creation. Creation's purpose is to relate to God in his Sabbath or rest within the creation. And we see this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all, from all his work of creation. Now, I don't have time to go through and explain the significance of all of these. They are really worth considering. But these are the four main points of this Genesis teaching. Each deals fundamentally with God's relationship with creation. And science doesn't have the power to either disprove or prove any of them. Or to put it this way, there is the cre science cannot, science cannot deal with these questions. It has no power. It lacks the strength to deal with God's relationship to creation. And none of what I've said here is particularly controversial to Christians. None of this can be either disproved or proved because that is not what the passage is about when it comes to science. Science deals with observable relationships of objects within creation. The Bible deals with God's relationship to the creation, but he steps and sits outside of the creation and therefore is not subject to being uh, observed through the use of science. Science has limits to its explanatory power. And this is where people go so wrong. Science is unable to deal with the many important questions that people have about their existence. And these are just three. And these are three limits to science that we need to keep when we're doing science. And the first one is science is limited to the observable universe. Science cannot see outside of the universe. It is limited by its bounds, both of space and time. It will never see outside the bounds of the universe and it cannot see beyond its beginning. It cannot tell you anything about existence prior to the universe beginning. Now, this is not an attack on science. It is just a recognition of its limits. Empiricism investigates relationships of objects within the creation. For that, it is an extremely powerful tool. But anything beyond that, it cannot do. Now, it would be easy for me to have a go at atheists at this point. But, the po but Christians need to take and heed this very carefully. Because 
Atheists will say, see, science disproves Christianity. And then we'll say, well, science can't do that. It can't see outside the universe. What are you doing? But then you often see Christians then get science and say, see, science proves Christianity. You can't say that makes no sense to one and then, oh, yeah, okay, then science proves my point, so therefore it's okay. No, science can neither prove or disprove Christianity. It just remains at its limits. And we as Christians must not use science. Every time I see videos on YouTube that says science now proves Christianity, I just ignore them because I know they're wrong. The second limit to science is we may, science has certain presuppositions that it cannot justify or prove. The empirical method has massive presuppositions built into it. The main one being it requires the universe to be consistent and it has no justifications internally for that existence. That the universe will act in a similar manner tomorrow that it is to today, it is the key foundation of all empirical methods. But there is no basis within the finite universe to guarantee that. People just rely upon that. And the question is, why? Why are you trusting that the universe will act the same tomorrow as it did today? What is your basis for this? This was the, the fundamental argument of David Hume, who attacked causation. He said, you have no reason to expect causation. And people just went, yeah, but if we can't, we can't do science. And he goes, yeah, I know, but why are you doing this? Why are you trusting this? So this is not just a Christian saying this. Atheists have realised the problem. And there has been answers to it, but none that have truly satisfied the answers. And that's not the only presupposition, that the universe is intelligible, that it is structured, that it is ordered, that our senses can work and make intelligible the nature of the universe. These are all presuppositions to science. And the question is, why are you doing this? Why are you trusting these things? You are placing your faith in them and they do work, but is it just because? If your answer is just because, that's called blind faith. You need to give a justification. And Christians do have a justification. It was in point two of the Genesis, uh, my second point in the Genesis teachings, that the creation is ordered and structured by God. Christians expect to find an ordered creation because we believe the creation comes from an ordered God. If you don't believe in an ordered God, you don't believe and there's something outside of the creation that is all to the creation, okay, fair enough. Why do you believe it then? Where do you get your faith that science is going to work? The third problem and limit of science is the problem of purpose. Questions such as why are we here? And this is where many people make a very big mistake. People think because we can test whether we've achieved a purpose, they will then go on to say, see, science can generate a purpose. But that is faulty thinking. Now, what we're talking about here is not subjective purposes. People can come up with subjective purposes all the time. What we're talking about are objective, universal or ultimate purposes. We are talking about purposes that would be the same no matter what place or what time we are in in the universe. These are purposes that exist uh, at all points of time, at all points of space. And the reason this is important is these purposes are essential to systems of justice. And none of these can be found through science. It's just impossible. That is why the statement in Genesis 1 where, where it says, and God saw that it was good, it's, just, it's not just a nice turn of phrase. It means that, this, that the creation is fit for the purpose God created it. If you were to look throughout the whole universe, you could turn over every page, you could look at every nook and cranny, under every rock, star, whatever. 
you will not find any meaning or purpose for anything in the universe. It is just not there. And that is the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what Ecclesiastes is teaching, and it taught that two and a half thousand years ago. The universe has no intrinsic meaning or purpose to it. It has no intrinsic purpose in its own nature. It's one of the reasons why it is so easy for us to put purpose on it, because no purpose exists intrinsically within it. But that means you are never going to find ultimate purposes, ultimate reasons, ultimate meaning. It is just going to be the dictates of your own subjective feelings. And in ultimate purpose and meaning is required for so much of what we do and believe and the way we act. Science cannot answer some pretty fundamental questions about reality. It is beyond the scope of its ability to investigate questions such as these, and there are others. God's transcendent nature, meaning his nature existing beyond man's capacity to directly observe, makes science incapable of dealing with these issues, dealing with these questions. And again, this is not a put down of science. It's just a recognition that it has limits to its ability. When in thinking through the empirical method to investigate God's relationship to creation, science really will never have the power to either prove or disprove Genesis 1 because Genesis 1 is not dealing with the questions that science is trying to answer. We need to turn to another method. We need to turn to another means to know a transcendent reality that exists outside of the creation. That is, we need to turn to God revealing himself. To know God requires God revealing himself to man. We don't have the ability to step outside of the creation and put God under the microscope and go, so God, what are you doing? It has to be God's decision of God's own will. And what the Bible is telling us is what God wills, God's purposes that are extrinsic to the creation, what are his purposes for doing what he has done with the creation? And this is where our reading from 1 Corinthians is so important. I just want to read one verse. And the verse here is verse 11 because it's key. For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. You could tell so many things about me. You could observe by who I'm married to, you could observe uh, what car I drive, the house I live, the children I have. You could observe so much of what I do. But you will never know the reason for the things I do unless you come and ask me. And that is true for all of us. We observe so much of what God is doing in the universe. The universe, God is constantly operating and caring for and looking after each and every moment of each and every day. And you can look and see it till the cows come home. You'll never know why God did it unless he chooses to reveal it to us. And that is what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is that God has revealed himself in the man Jesus Christ and has come into this world to show his character, his nature, his love, his mercy, his justice for a creation that had rebelled against him. You're not going to get that looking at science. You're not going to get that looking at the world. All you're going to see is a man upon a cross dying and go, why is that? It is the Bible who te which tells us why that is the case. It is the case because 
in Jesus dying on the cross, God was pouring out all his justice, all his wrath upon this man. And he was saying, you need to place your trust in him. You need to put your hope and your faith that he will pay for the forgiveness of your sins. That is not going to come through science. You're not going to learn that there. You're only going to learn that at the place where God reveals it in his word. The Bible is the history, the record of God's continual love of saving his people from their slavery. And the greatest slavery we have is our slavery to sin. Science can't prove or disprove whether that's true. It is beyond the scope of its power. It's not an attack on science. It's just an acknowledgement of what it can and can't do. Which just leaves one final question. Can a person do science without God, without knowing God? And the answer is yes. And I'm just going to read from Matthew chapter 16, only four verses. The Pharisees and the Sadducees approached and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes to you, you say, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. Here Jesus is again, it's not his main point, but it is pointing out and highlighting the limits of science. Here he's saying, you look at the heavens, you look at the sky, and by the judging of the sky, you can tell whether it's going to be rainy, you can tell whether it's going to be a nice day, it's going to be a good day, or it's going to be stormy. You can look and you can see it. How can you look at the world, understand what's happening, and not understand me? That's the point. And what Jesus is saying, and this is what we've got to realise, we must not be arrogant in our knowledge of the world. We have been given so many good things through science. Science is a wonderful tool. And in terms of times or ages to live in, this is the one. This is a great age. But we must not use the knowledge we've been given through science to arrogantly think we understand everything. That would be foolish. There are some truly brilliant scientists in the world, men like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is an atheist, who I could listen to for ages as he speaks about his subject. He's a brilliant man. But when he comes to this subject, his brilliance in one area blinds him to his ignorance of another. And that is foolish. As Christians, we need to be careful. As people, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that what we know about the world, what we understand about the world, doesn't invalidate what God is saying to us about the world. Because at the end of the day, what God says about the world and what God thinks about the world and what God thinks more importantly about you and I is far more important than what we think about it. God is saying this. If you want to know me, if you want to know who I am, if you want to know where I've revealed myself, I've revealed myself through a man, Jesus. And I've revealed the essence and character of my nature in him dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Come know me where I have revealed myself. Can science disprove Christianity? No, and it never will, because it lacks its power to do so. When we want to come and know who God is, we mustn't go to science. We must go to the place where God has revealed himself through the death and resurrection 
of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. things I'd like to share with you about our church family life, uh, a couple in particular. Now over the next few weeks, school holidays, which means a lot of our regular midweek ministries won't be on. Uh, If you're a part of a Bible study group, if you're uh, attending or your kids or youth attend some of those ministries, they usually are having a break over the school holidays to give the leaders a rest in particular. But hey, why don't I, can I encourage you to take that time to hang out with others, to organise something, something social maybe, and, uh, and spend time in fellowship with God's people. Over the three Sundays of the school holidays, we're going to uh, engage with some visions of a holy God. It feels like the last six months to a year, we've done a lot of work on church and us and a whole bunch of good things like that. We're going to stop and gaze upon our God for a while. As we engage, uh, we're going to spend some time in Isaiah, some time in Exodus, and a bit of time in Revelation. Uh, each of the three weeks reflecting upon who our God is and how it is that he calls us 
to lives of deeper holiness. Can I encourage you to prepare for that? Be praying, be seeking God out, spend some time asking God to take you into deeper holiness, that you might live a life that is like his. That's coming up in the next few weeks uh, before we get back into the second half of Genesis. We did the first half last year. We're going to do the second half of Genesis throughout term three this year. So I commend that to you. And can as well, can I ask you to be praying for our staff families, for the Wiltshires and the Richards in particular. They'll be taking some time off over these school holidays. So would you be praying for them that they get some good rest and uh, come back recharged and re-energised for the challenges of ministry life? Let's pray together now. We're going to pray for all people and for Christ's church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, through the Apostle Paul, you teach us to pray and to give thanks for all people. And so in your mercy, receive our prayers. Set the nations on the path of righteousness and peace. Lead their rulers to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare of all. We pray for the leaders of our nation and for all who exercise authority in this land. Enable them to uphold justice, restrain wickedness and promote integrity and truth. Comfort and sustain, merciful Lord, everyone in this fleeting life who is in sorrow, need, sickness or any other distress. Pour out your spirit on your church that all who acknowledge your holy name may agree in the truth of your word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace to all bishops and other ministers to set forth your life-giving word by their example and teaching and rightly administer your holy sacraments. Give grace to your people to receive your word with humble and obedient hearts, to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. We praise you for all who have died in the faith of Christ. Help us to follow their good examples, that with them we may inherit your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen.
Great encouragement, excellent teaching to be reminded that this world belongs to God, that the scientific method is possible only because of God's character, because he is a God who is consistent and therefore this world is one that is consistent. Strengthening to be taught. Science hasn't disproven religion, it can't really by its methods. On the contrary, we trust what we know and see and understand in the world because we trust God. How powerful to be reminded that in the end we know God, not by science or experiments, 
but because he has revealed himself to us. We know him by his spirit. We know him by his son. Now, I hope that what you've heard today is encouraging to you, it's strengthening, it's answered questions if you had them. As always, if you keep having more questions, please reach out. We'd love to be in touch with you. Can I commend next week to you as we get into Isaiah chapter 6, the vision that Isaiah had of a holy God, how it led him into deeper holiness. Make sure you don't miss it. Until then, God bless. Dwell forever